Hello, welcome to Annoyed Gamer. As you can see, I am not on the usual Annoyed Gamer set. Hell, I haven't even got the logo floating behind me. The reason being, I actually recorded the, the Annoyed Gamer you're about to see last week at PAX. And it's not even a regular type show where I ranty ranty about stuff. It's actually an interview with Jim Sterling. That's right, Jim Sterling of Destructoid and Escapist fame. Uh, a very opinionated fellow Brit, a hell of a guy, a hell of a journalist. I figured it was about time the two of us got together and talked and the world didn't end. So um, that's nice. Anyway, uh, enjoy the interview. We talk about a good few things. Jim is an excellent, excellent interview subject. And uh, I'll be back next week with a more traditional Annoyed Gamer because there is a lot of stuff bubbling inside me. None of it good. Okay, this is a special treat for you. It's also a special treat for me because to be honest with you, I have wanted to get in front of a camera with this man for Ooh, at least 18 months, almost two years. Um, Jim Sterling is on this very special PAX Annoyed Gamer spin-off episode. Jim, thank you for getting on. I mean, seriously, the amount of thank sex that we have me. on this camera right yeah, now, yeah. it's mental. And this is actually uh, kind of cool because you generally don't come out to events normally. No, this is actually, this is my first PAX in two years. I missed last year. Um, because I couldn't be bothered. Yeah. <laughs> uh, didn't do E3 last year, won't be doing E3 again. Well, that's interesting. I mean, you know, the fact that you, you know, you're up hack style, but you made the decision not to do any more previews, and that's why mm -hmm. you've 86 D3, because it is a preview friendly event. So, what was your thinking behind the whole, you're not going to do previews anymore? Because you have a big audience, you have a, you know, people sure. who follow you, and I'm sure people want, you know, a damn good preview from you. Well, I mean, it was a number of things that kind of contributed to it. The first thing was way back with the whole Doritos Gate thing with the whole Lauren Wainwright and Jeff Keighley and, and that whole conversation about how close the press are to publishers. Yeah. And I decided I didn't want any kind of that conflict of interest. So my first decision was no more preview events where the publishers, the PR pay for your flight, pay for your hotel. I've done those things in the past and I thought, Now's a good time to not do that anymore. The, you know, everyone's having this conversation. It's decided people would like a bit more distance. I'd like a bit more distance, so why not? Um, so that was that for a while. I was still thinking of doing previews, still thinking of E3. Um, another big contributor was Aliens Colonial Marines, um, in which I previewed that and really liked it. I played some of the multiplayer, it was cool. Um, they showed us that tech demo. Which I saw for the first time last year at PAX, and I was sold. Yeah. I thought yeah. it was going to be the game we'd all wanted for the last 20 years. Yeah, and it turned out it was bullshitty bollocks. Yes. Uh, so I decided after that, I felt terrible because I was telling everyone this game's going to be great. I was excited for it. And it was, it wasn't even interesting enough to be in my running for the worst game of 2013. It doesn't even deserve that distinction. So, that, it's a... a the trash right. can's right there. Yeah. Yes. It's still my worst game of 2013. I mean, it's, I, because well, I actually invested a few hours in playing it. Mm, and yeah, uh, yeah, I've never seen Hadley's Hope looking so bad. Yeah. So, I felt terrible for the whole doing that kind of preview and, and I was, just thinking how controlled those environments are, so I just thought, screw it, no more previews. Um, not that I've got anything against people who do them. Um, that I'm not racist, but... Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I like reading previews, but I don't feel that's something I can be comfortable doing. Uh, anymore. This has been the, the sort of like the unwritten rule of the games industry, ever, you know, ever since I started, you know, doing the PR stuff, is that when you do the previews, you're automatically given a pass. It's automatically everybody hopes for the best. Yeah, I mean, um, the default mode. And if you end up ever writing and, and doing previews and stuff, um, the default thing they tell you is cautious optimism. Yeah. That's the default mode you write a preview for. There can be exceptions. I previewed, and this is another like bit of evidence as to why previews can be misleading. I previewed Silent Hill Downpour and slated it. So this is the worst thing I've played at, at E3. And I actually really loved Silent Hill Downpour. I'm one of the few people that do, but it, I loved it. And the preview was just so non-indicative. So, yeah, it's and that, that's why I kind of kept that split. Well, I think we've also stepped away from cautious optimism. I mean, I think that mantra, that's gone several years ago. I think I don't think anybody subscribes to that anymore. I think it's just like, oh, there's this, and look at it, pretty, and here's the exclusive video, and here's the interview. And yeah. it's, I would like, I would like to go back to 
honestly, uh, you know, being brutally honest and saying, all right, th there is a caveat. This is an unfinished bill. This is a preview version. This is a vertical slice, if you will. But these are the issues I have with it. Yeah. I mean, and I did that on South Park Stick of Truth. Uh, I'm still not sold on it, um, based on what I saw at E3. Sure. And that's maybe, you know, they picked the wrong demo to show. Maybe it was a little too repetitive. Maybe I'm just expecting too much out of South Park game. Yeah, yeah. But I would definitely like people to be a little more honest and, uh, you know, forthright. If something looks like an ass, say it looks like ass. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, how else will they know to improve? I mean, I've tried that before. I played a preview build and, and told people what I thought the problem was. And the studios don't bother listening. Yeah. <laughs> so it just becomes an exercise in frustration. Now, um, I'm going to take you back in time. Four years. Little... I can't even remember yesterday, so this is going to have to be really vivid. A little game called Deadly Premonition. Oh, well that, I... I yeah. PR'd that. Oh, awesome. And that game, we had we had a 2 out of 10 from IGN. Yep. And I was like, all right, this game's going to kill. And then you came along. <laughs> and that's, that's honestly when the man crush kind of developed, because you got how insane and loopy... I mean, the game, yeah, game engine, not so great. Oh, yeah, I mean, it looks sub PS2 but yeah. it doesn't matter it's got this this just innate charm and yeah the acting is a little bit wooden but the story is so fantastically daft yeah, yeah. and I credit you with that game it, after your review hit it actually sold out I'd heard stories yeah heard it stories. sold out it was amazing. number one on Amazon and then we decided to spoof it with the, the game of year edition with the coffee cup and everything yeah. and everybody bought into that we never actually produced it. But yeah, I just I think it's interesting how when we're talking about we talk about previews, we talk about reviews and how you can have two different sides of, of a coin where you've got a two out of ten on one side and you've got a ten out of ten. Yeah. And I think And people get annoyed by that when they see a score they don't like, but I'm like, I wasn't pissed that IGN didn't like it and I did. I mean that was my computer desktop for a while. Yeah. Was the Metacritic when it was just me and IGN, just the two and the ten. And that was my desktop wallpaper for a while. I, I think it's interesting. It keeps the industry more interesting when people aren't agreeing on stuff. I, used to, I mean, I actually used to be the other side of it where I was like, oh, well, I really like this game and there's no faults in it. And you gave it a seven and I would have given it a nine. You're an asshole. And I'm starting to see that that was, yeah. that was not smart. And I, I know I'm starting to step back from it because, I mean, it is, it's all opinion based. And that's yeah. all reviews are. Exactly. Well, the way I look at it is I'm a massive fan of Dynasty Warriors. And if I got upset every time someone gave me a negative review, I'd be the unhappiest fucker alive. Because you've calmed down a little. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've scaled back. Yeah, you, you used to be, you know, you'd get into fights with people that made my fights look like, you know, tickle, <laughs> tickle fest. Um, but now you've scaled back and all of a sudden the pressure's on me to go and annoy the shit out of people. Um, but there must be something that's still, you know, great that has done for several years. I think it's, it's one of the topics that comes up on Jimquisition a lot, which is just industry spending. Just, and, and I was thinking about this the other day, it's funny, because in general life, I'm like the worst kind of woolly liberal, but when it comes to the industry, I'm like the biggest fiscal conservative you could think of, because they're just spending way too much money. Uh, the last video I did, the, um, the one, yeah, last Monday's Jimquisition was about uh, Payday 2 and how, they were profitable before the thing even launched because they spent their money wisely. And we get people telling us it has to be this way. You've got to spend millions and millions. You've got to have a brand new engine for every game you make. And you don't. Demon Souls sold, um, no, Dark Souls sold two million copies and was a success. Uh, Resident Evil 6 sold, uh, like, what was it? almost six million copies and was a failure. It, how does it? that work? How does that work? What's Tell it? me, you worked in PR, how does it work? It, well, it doesn't. I mean, you look at Tomb Raider. Tomb Raider sold three million the first month, deemed a, f a failure. Great game. A very good game. Um, Didn't Res need individual tessellated hair physics. Or the individual strands on the on the tank top. But, yeah. but I think it's also, it's also down to mismanagement at a very high level. I mean, and, and this is what one of my hopes for the next gen that we yeah. will see this bigger push towards the indies, the self-publishing. Uh, we were discussing actually before uh, off camera, one of the biggest pet peeves for both of us now is how we get press releases from PR companies talking about a Kickstarter for an indie game. Mm. So how much of that Kickstarter money is already allocated before it yeah. comes in to a PR person? Do you need a PR person to do a Kickstarter game? 
I mean, it's... You know, we're, all, we're all in the internet now. We do our own PR. Yeah. Uh, and we see this with some of the Kickstarters now where developers get more money than they even imagine they get and still run out of budget and need to come up with new ways to make more money. Um, and I think it's because they're just all stuck in this mindset of spend, 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 worry about the bill later. Yeah. And it can't keep going on that way. I think the AAA industry right now is this Rube Goldberg machine where nobody knows quite how it works. They're just hoping it still does for the next few years. And I don't think that's a way to run a business. And I think we're going to see a lot more THQs. Because yeah. who had the biggest parties at E3? Who would put journalists up in like five-star hotels? Who would have giant 12-foot tall space marines clomping around the show floor? THQ. Who's in business now? Not fucking THQ. Well, and you also look at it, I mean, you look at THQ, they had Saints Row. And Saints Row 3 came out critically well received, mm -hmm. fun mm -hmm. game, sold enough to make it profitable for somebody, but not for THQ. Yeah. Saints Row 4 goes to Deep Silver. They have a more restrained PR and marketing outreach. From what outreach. I've heard, half the marketing budget of Saints Row the Third, double the sales yeah. of Saints Row the Third. Well, a million, they shifted a million units, sold a million units week one for Saints Row 4, yeah. which is more than, um, you know, the, the previous th uh, like three times I yeah. think what the original sold so it's quality over quantity it is it's you don't almost need like the big if piss you ups. budget accordingly and don't spend more money than you have it's almost as if you make money it's 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 random. incredible I think it's this new like kind of magic that the tech priests have discovered it's called math yeah it's amazing it's like putting away the credit card I mean I was I was raised not to have a credit card it's like pay what pay as you go mm -hmm. for what you do what you do and I think we're getting away from that I think it's going to be interesting that EA is big. Are they too big to fail? Activision, are they too big to fail? I mean, those are those are the two behemoths. I like the way that Deep Silver's going mm -hmm. uh, with you know quality over quantity. Exactly. I like the way Bethesda is Bethesda going. Bethesda is yeah, they're yeah. fantastic for it. Ubisoft, they're kind of they kind of straddled the line. Yeah. They they really need to learn not to oversaturate stuff to the point of death. I think they're going to do to Assassin's Creed what Activision did to Guitar Hero in the end. Call of Duty. Yeah. Which so, they're still doing, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we'll see, but I think that that's what needs to stop. Just the, the extravagance of it. It's like we're in the fall of Rome right now. Just the things are crumbling and they're still ordering another five grice. Another reason why I like this guy. I mean, we're, on the, we're definitely on the same wavelength. What's the one thing you're looking forward to this Christmas to, to play? Not as, you know, not as a journalist, but as Jim the Gamer. Uh, this is where I'm a hypocrite and say Killzone Shadowfall. Doubtless an expensive game, part of a big franchise. But I love me some Killzone. Apparently, if you believe certain areas, it's uh, pre-ordering very, very highly. I think so. I mean, I'm just, I'm looking forward to the PS4 in general. The Xbox One, of course, did sour me with its original intent, but... I'm at least interested in having a conversation now about the Xbox One rather than before. Oh, but yeah. stuff like Rise, Son of Rome ain't going to sell me. Have you seen it on the show floor? I have. It doesn't look good. Uh, but the PS4 stuff does look pretty exciting. You know, we've got Second Son, Killzone, and just all the indie stuff. You know, Octo Dad and Don't Starve. And it's exciting to see those kinds of games get given top billing by a company like Sony. So. You're not getting excited for Gran Turismo 26? What? <laughs> Gran Turismo? No? What? Yeah, exactly. Huh? I told you, Kyle. We were having the conversation earlier where he's like, oh, it's going to be huge on the PS3. And I'm like, whatever. It might be. I don't want to insult the series. It's just, it's not my cup of tea. Exactly. I mean, you know, we like driving grown-up cars anyway. Yeah. All right. Thank you oh, thank so you much. Thank you so much. This it was, was a pleasure. Awesome. So, yeah, you can follow Jim on Twitter and check out The Escapist for Inquisition every week. It's basically like what I do, but way smarter. But I still have the sexier accent. It does have the sexier accent.